All right, let's talk about stocks. The stock is the part you graft onto. Uh, obviously, the most um, obvious reason that you need a stock is for roots. Half the magic of a tree is underground, where the tree is gathering resources to grow the tree and grow the fruit and everything. So you need good roots. And that's relevant because the roots of different stocks are different. Just like one tree will grow a red apple and another one will grow a green apple, they also have other different characteristics. The trees are different colors. Some are vigorous, some are not. Some have fibrous root systems, some have deep heavy root systems, some are good at uh, foraging for water and being drought tolerant, and others are not. Some of them are more rot resistant when they're water sitting in waterlogged soil, even in the summer. And so like these are dwarfing root stocks here, and they will just not feed the top of the tree enough to grow a big tree, and you'll end up with a tree that's maybe eight feet tall. Other stocks are known as basically just full-size stocks, like most, most seedling stocks, if you just plant a seed and graft onto it, and they're gonna grow like a full-size gigantic apple tree under good conditions. And there's extremely dwarf trees, and there's huge trees, and there's everything in between. There's also a difference in uh, cold hardiness of stocks. So there are stocks that'll grow a tree in Siberia, and other ones that under those conditions are just gonna bite it the first winter. Disease resistance. There are, you know, stocks that are resistant to numerous diseases. Like here, for instance, I use M111 a lot just because it's recommended by locals all the time. It is resistant to woolly aphid. It is resistant to uh, waterlogged soils, but it's also resistant to drought because we don't get any rain for six months of the year. And there's other disease resistance, crown rot resistance, fire blight resistance, all kinds of stuff. And you can do the research on that to figure out which stock you want for all those different attributes. There is also a difference in the fruit size and quality and how soon the tree bears fruit. The fruit size and quality are less pronounced, but you know, some people say it's a big difference and others think kind of think it's not a big difference. And there's definitely a difference in how soon they bear and how much they bear and all that kind of stuff. So the stock does have a big influence. There's all kinds of charts and tables out there and you can do all the research. So similarly to growing a fruit, so I grow an apple from seed and I like it and I start to clone it from cuttings and I graft those onto root, other roots and grow them out. And I'm growing the same plant. I'm just cloning it over and over again. And they do the same thing with rootstocks. So there's breeding programs just for rootstocks. When you get a good one, you propagate it clonally and get rooted cuttings and then those are what we graft to. Otherwise, if you plant an apple tree from seed, you don't know if it's gonna get that same disease resistance or same type of root system or same size or any of that. So you can go and shop around for all those different clonal rootstocks and there's more coming out all the time. There's charts comparing them all that you know say the size and the disease resistance or lack thereof, susceptibilities. There are places that sell rootstock. You can buy small quantities from certain small nurseries. Just you know do a Google search for apple rootstock. And the two big places that I bought from, if you buy 50 to 100 stocks or more, you can get them from uh, places like Copenhagen and Willamette Nurseries. And I've had really good luck with both of those guys. And they're much cheaper that way. If you buy them by the piece, um, they're quite a bit more unless you buy bundles of 10. I don't know, you do, you do the math, you do the shopping. The other possibility obviously is we can graft onto an already existing tree. So let's take a look at that just really briefly. I want to talk about a couple of important points and then we'll get on to actually grafting. No we won't because I have to tell you where to get your own rootstock. So you can stool it and grow it yourself. These are just suckers that I pulled off. You know they had sprouted from a root of another tree that I grafted and so I just pulled them off with some roots and these can be used just the way they are. You can also propagate them by planting, you know, I could plant one of these for instance and then when it grew up I can cut it off and then when it starts to grow again in the spring, pile up like damp sawdust or potting soil or even just garden soil. Keep that damp all summer and they'll grow roots out of the sides of the shoots. In the spring you knock down that mound or take away the sawdust or whatever and you clip these off with their roots and then graft those. And that's basically how they make all those clonal rootstocks. Back in the old days a lot of apples were grafted onto either crab apple or just regular apple seedlings. So they would grow out seedlings and you could buy bundles of seedlings too to graft onto and you just graft onto those. You don't know what you're getting in that case and most of the time they're going to be large uh, vigorous trees 
but it totally works. Great way to get some free rootstock. Also, if you really want the tree to have a deep natural root system, you can plant the seeds right in place where you're gonna grow them, let them grow for a year, and then graft onto them. Okay, now let's go look at Franken tree over here and some concerns about grafting onto an existing framework. Okay, this is a branch on Franken tree that I had started to regraft because after a number of years it started to fruit and it just wasn't anything to write home about. So I started to add varieties to it. Now what you don't want to do, and a lot of people make this mistake, is go out here way out to the edges of a large tree and graft onto there because you're just going to keep getting it further and further out. Like this won't even support the weight of you know the fruit out here is just going to go like that and this shouldn't be allowed to grow out any further than this anyway it should be managed like that this is kind of like the outer limits of how big this tree should be it's actually a little far even instead i'm going to go keep the main framework of the branch like this branch is kind of a main branch what i'm going to do is go all the way back here near the branch and cut that off and i'm going to graft right here and that means that I'm gonna grow another branch that's gonna replace that, but it's never gonna get huge. It's just gonna be a small branch fruiting here, but it's not gonna be way out there. So think about the main structure and the main branches and visualize those and try to go back closer. That means you're often gonna be grafting a small scion into a relatively large piece of wood. I mean, this is only a half inch, so that's no big deal at all. None of it's a big deal. You can graft into stuff that's big if you want, but I like to keep it uh, relatively small, maybe ideally is like up to three quarters of an inch, but if you have to do something bigger, uh, an inch, even an inch and a half, that's totally fine. The common option is to take the whole tree and just cut the whole thing down or cut really big branches way back and just chainsaw them off and then graft like a bunch of sticks in there and then let the thing grow a whole new tree. If you use frameworking, frameworking retains the framework of the tree and just adds stuff like this. So it fruits much faster, it's much less traumatic to the tree because you're not taking these giant cuts that are gonna get infected with fungus and stuff like that. So it heals really quick, it produces fruit sooner. In every way, just about, it's superior except that it takes longer and it takes more scions. But for a homeowner, um, small orchards and stuff like that, uh, frameworking often will make a lot more sense. I'll cut in some pictures here of a framework tree that was at a neighbor's place and we just cut the whole thing back in one year except for one part that she wanted to keep the apples on the, uh, that were already there in one section of the tree, that I've kept the whole main branch framework and I just have all these kind of stubs to graft onto and most of those stubs are about three quarters of an inch and down. Some of them are up to an inch. Within a year, that tree looked pretty filled out. Within two years, three years, like now it probably looks totally normal. And there are cases when you might want to go further back in. This particular variety just grows really funny, or the Tiedemann's late orange that was here. It tends to grow out, but then it'll have all these suckers growing up. And I knew that if I kept the main branch structure, I was always going to be fighting those suckers. So this one, even though some of the branches were up to almost two inches in diameter, I cut back and grafted in close to the tree so that everything that grows out from this point, I know is going to be that, you know, variety that I wanted, the new variety that I grafted on. But in general, like even if this tree had one inch branches here, I would have usually kept the structure. If I regrafted this now, I would be taking these branches and I would be saying, I'm going to put, you know, cut this back to this main branch here, put one on, cut this back, put one on there, you know, cut this off, put one there, put one up here, etc. And keep the branch structure because this branch structure took two years to grow already. And so I don't need to regrow that again.